stream as well. Okay, let me move this thing out of the way. Okay, so I have pulled up here formative assessment number four. Grades have been updated um, this morning, by the way, so you should be able to see all your points and whatnot. Uh, first question, what is a logit and what is a probit? So uh, most of you had this down to some extent. It's a nonlinear transformation. So these are what's known more generally as link functions, L-I-N-K, and the link is the equation. So the link to go from probability to logits is the log of the odds of the probability of a one, for instance. Probit is a z-score. So if you picture um, the idea of what is the area under the curve under the normal distribution at different points to the left, or sorry, this way for you guys to the left, uh, the probit is the z-score that goes with that probability. So it has the same characteristics as logit in that a probability of 0.5 corresponds to a logit or a probit of zero. They both range from negative to positive infinity, so they can be predicted by a, a linear model. The difference is in their scale. So probit has a variance of one, whereas a logit has a variance of pi squared over three, which translates to 3.29 given the logistic distribution. So they differ in the philosophy of what is the distribution of the continuous variable that underlies the binary response. If that continuous variable is thought to have a logistic distribution, that's consistent with the logit link and a variance of 3.29. If that underlying distribution is, is consistent with a normal distribution, that's a probit link and a variance of 1. But because we don't actually have the underlying distribution, we don't know which is correct. They're just both different ways of taking a bounded probability to be predicted and translating it, translating it into a metric that is unbounded. That is what they are for. And if I had my choice, I wouldn't even bother with probit. I would just be like, here's the logit, because the logit, if you unlog it, exponentiate the results, you can get log odds, go from log odds just to odds and that's an effect size measure, and you can go down to probability as well, and so there's these nice and easy conversions between the two, whereas if you have the probit, you'd have to do integration to figure out what the corresponding probability is, or go to the back of a textbook where they've worked out you know, an approximation to that. The reason that this matters, as we're gonna talk about today, if you are estimating these models using maximum likelihood, you can choose your link. You can choose to put it in logits or you can choose to put it in probits. If you are using the other method of estimation that we're going to talk about, the limited information, WLSMV, that is only available in probits. So it, it helps to be familiar with both because sometimes you don't get a choice as to which you have. So any questions on that one? Not yet, okay. The next one, definitions. So IRT models for binary responses. So the terminology IRT or item response theory corresponds to a way of talking about these models. A parameterization is the technical term that uses A, B, C, and D parameters when you're an IRT models for binary data. There'll be other names for IRT models for ordinal data, but they all have A and B-like parameters to them. So A is item discrimination, B is item difficulty. More specifically, A is the slope at the point of difficulty. It conveys how related the trait as the predictor is to the item as the response to be predicted. So steeper slopes indicate better items at that point of difficulty. And I say at that point, let me bring up a picture here. One second, there we go. Because the relationship between the trait on the x-axis and the probability to be predicted is nonlinear. So A is the slope of the line at this point. If we're writing the, module, the model and predicting the logit directly, then that's a linear slope and A is just the slope of the line in predicting the logit. So the equation right here, for instance, the idea of A is constant if you're predicting the logit, 
but it works out to be A at the inflection point, at A at the item difficulty location, when you're talking about the slope as it relates to probability. So a few folks said that A was difficulty. It is not. A is always a slope. It always conveys how related the item is to the trait, which is discrimination, which is how good it is. B is location. It is the amount of the trait needed to have a 50% probability of getting a 1, specifically. That is what B means. Um, we will have analogous versions of B when we get to ordinal models, but it will always be a location. And there are not necessarily good or bad with respect to B, because items that are located at different points are intended to discriminate amongst different kinds of people. So if you have an item that has a B value, say, of negative 2, that would be a really easy item and it would discriminate amongst people at theta levels around negative 2, but it would not discriminate amongst people at theta levels, say, of 1 or 2, for which the probability would be near 1. Same thing if the item difficulty was, say, a difficulty of 2, that's a very difficult item. You would have a very low probability of getting that right until you hit a theta of 2, and it's designed to discriminate amongst high theta people. So. Location just tells you where the item is going to be useful with respect to the trait. So any questions on that, A's and B's? All right, now, loadings, thresholds, and intercepts. Oh, my. This one I got to get the picture for. So there was a lot of confusion on this one, so I want to make sure that we go back over the terminology here. So the models that we're talking about that have loadings, intercepts, and thresholds are written this way. So you can say that the logit or probit of the item response is the intercept plus the loading times the factor. So if you're writing it this way, the intercept in this model has the same interpretation that it does in any model. The intercept is always the expected outcome when the predictors are zero. That is what it means. In this context, the intercept is the expected outcome, which is the logit, which is the log of the odds of the probability of the 1, or a probit, which is the z-score that goes with the probability of a 1, when theta, or the factor score, is zero. So the intercept gives you the y value when x is 0. So if we go down to the picture here, that is the red line here. That's the intercept. And it's in logits, so you'd have to back translate that into probability to figure out where it is on this y-axis, which is shown in the probability metric. To go from logits back to probabilities, by the way, is known as an inverse link function. And it's e to the logit over 1 plus e to the logit to do so. So a B value then is related to an intercept, but they're not the same thing. So B tells you the location on the X axis where Y is zero. So Y is zero, the logit Y, when you have a probability of 0.5. So the job of B as difficulty is to give you the theta value it takes to hit 0.5. So B gives you the location on X where Y is 0, whereas the intercept gives you the location on Y, no, wait, hang on, L the, yes, the location on Y where X is 0. I had this all foiled out, now I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to say it again. Okay, I got to close my eyes and concentrate. B gives you the location on x where y is 0, and the intercept gives you the location on y when x is 0. So they're both relative to something being 0, but what that something is is different. And because these are going opposite conceptually, higher intercepts correspond to a greater logit of getting something right, which means the item is easier. The way that that inconsistency is resolved is by translating the intercept into a threshold. 
And some of you said that they that the intercept is the inverse of the threshold. It's not a ratio of one over, which I think is what inverse means. It's the negative. So it's a difference in sign. So minus one times the intercept gives you the threshold. So if the intercept gives you the expected logit of a one when theta is zero, the threshold gives you the expected logit of a zero when theta is zero. And thresholds are consistent in that lower values indicate easier items and higher values indicate more difficult items. So the, the moral of the story is that when you get a set of numbers out on your software, you need to be very careful about what they are. <laughs> that is the moral of the story here. If you are in a model in which the theta variance is fixed to one, then the factor loading given by lambda is the same thing as the A discrimination, but they are on, but they're different if the factor variance is not one. And the others you can find as a linear combination as well. I've got, let me see, back up a little bit. Here, slide 60 gives the conversion. So if your software gives you a version that you don't want, for instance, if it only gives you thresholds and you want to report B values, you can ask it to convert them. So you can get the B given the threshold. And if theta's mean is zero and theta's variance is one, then this simplifies to just the threshold divided by the loading. So we will get a chance to practice this for ordinal models, uh, likely starting next week, if not today, because M plus does not give B values for ordinal models. It only gives thresholds. But we can write estimate statements, the, the model constraint new command, the same way that you did for omega. We can use that same technology to ask it to estimate Bs out of our thresholds. So fear not. You can always get the one that is implied if you can do the algebra to get the rearrangement. OK. So questions on any of those terms? All right, then do you want to talk about estimation? Said no one ever. But I, I promise it will be quick and painless because I am not an estimation person. This is not my strong suit. I'm just going to level with you. I am a psychologist, so I did not get trained in the nitty gritty of estimation, and so my understanding of it is not as great as I wish it were, to be honest, but I have picked up enough to where I think we can go over the highlights of what makes these approaches different and how that controls what you can and cannot do with respect to assessing model fit. So let me get to that section. All right, so picking up on slide 67 in lecture five, there are two main games in town with respect to how these models get estimated. One of them uses all the data and makes model fit a pain in the ass. The other uses a summary of the data and makes model fit assessment way easier. There's the big picture for you. So why is the first one more, more painful and why would you want to do it? So what all do we have to estimate? So let's think about this problem in the context of the example that we've been working with. We had seven items. Uh, we had about 635 older adults who answered whether or not they could do each of seven activities of daily living. We did that. And we found out in that data set that a model where each item had its own A slash factor loading, it's where the contribution of the trait in predicting each item was allowed to vary across the items, different slopes for different items. That model, the 2PL, fit better than the 1PL. Uh, the 1PL, otherwise known as the Roche model, where all the loadings are constrained to be the same. So let's say that we're going to have the 2PL then what we have to estimate are seven discriminations or loadings, take your pick, and seven difficulties or thresholds, take your pick. Once we have one, we can get to the other. Because we have a single factor model, we don't have any factor covariances that we need to worry about. 
And because the model is identified such that the factor mean is zero and the factor variance is one, we don't have to worry about those either. So all we have are the item parameters. And those are being treated as fixed effects, meaning that each item is going to get its own version and we can't make any sort of inference as to what it would be like for some other item. Like we're talking about item one specifically, item two specifically. So items are being treated as fixed effects. They are not interchangeable. If we added more items to the model, we'd have more parameters to estimate. In contrast, the thetas. So vocabulary review, when I say theta, you can think factor score, latent trait, latent factor, latent variable, latent construct, and true score. Any of those, that's what I mean by theta. The thing we're trying to measure that varies across people. Theta is a random effect. That means that we don't actually need to know what theta is for each person. Person 1's theta and person 2's theta and person 3's theta, those are not model parameters the same way that item 1's a and B are model parameters, and item two's A and B are model parameters. People are random effects. What that means is that all we want is a summary of the distribution across persons, the mean, the variance, and the covariance. In this case, we don't need to estimate any of those because they're fixed for identification. But the fact that we don't have these random effects in the model is both good and bad. It's good in the sense that if we treated people as fixed effects, the more people that we added, the more parameters we'd have to estimate. So it would actually make it harder if you had a bigger sample than easier. We don't want that. Um, but it makes it problematic in that we have to have some reasonable guess as to what each person's theta is in order to figure out the predicted probabilities. We have to plug something in the equation to make it work. And so estimation, is much more complicated in these models because of this process of plugging something into theta um, in order to find all of the other parameters that we do need to estimate for the items. So there are um, a couple of different ways historically that people have used maximum likelihood to estimate these models. Um, the term that you'll see in this context is full information. So whenever you see that term, that means you're using all of the original data. You're feeding all of the data into the likelihood. So you're getting a height for all the answers that a person gave for each of the people. Uh, question, usually we can still estimate theta for each person, but we don't care about. So you're not actually estimating theta for each person. You are generating a predicted theta for each person meaning that you don't have to do that in order to get your item parameters. You can choose to do that in order to, be, to develop some sort of score for each person, but what theta actually is, like when you generated factor scores for your assignments, that is the mean of a distribution of what the factor score could be for each person. That is what the factor score is. It is a mean of a distribution and you get a standard error that goes with it that characterizes the width of the distribution. But that secondary process of asking for the factor score for each person is analogous to generating predicted outcomes for each person. You don't have to do it to get to the model parameters. Theta is not a model parameter. Okay, he says, thank you. All right, um, so full information is one category of information, one category of estimation. And when we talked about CFA, we were doing full information CFA as well. There are two older methods that you may hear about that tend not to get used as much. There's conditional maximum likelihood and joint maximum likelihood. Conditional can only be used in the Roche model where the number correct is a sufficient statistic for theta, and joint maximum likelihood treats people as the fixed effects, which means more people, more problems. So we don't want those. So what we do want is what's known as marginal maximum likelihood. It's a full information approach where we're going to marginalize over theta in trying to get um, the most likely value of each of the item parameters. So it's the same idea that 
we saw for CFA in terms of trying to maximize a height. But what the height is, is going to be different. And in order for what I'm about to describe to work, it relies on two different versions of an assumption of independence. One is that the items are independent after controlling for all the thetas. So all of the reasons why the items would have been correlated have to be inputted into the model as some kind of factor. Um, a lot of you had error covariances in your assignment for homework three. You can't have those in these models when they're estimated for maximum likelihood. You have to find some kind of way to introduce that additional relationship as being due to a factor. Because these models don't have error variances, and so therefore you can't have error covariances either. So that, that will require a change in approach that we will talk about in this context, but there's no error covariances. So all of the reasons why the items are related have to be represented as some kind of factor or random effect. Um, the other is that people are independent. What we're going to end up doing is adding together the log of the heights across people under an assumption of independence. And so if people are related, you need a model that builds in that additional relationship. So you would need, say, a multi-level version of an IRT model or a multi-level version of a CFA model. Those exist. They're just a little more complicated. Um, so we all also have to assume that we know what distribution the thetas came from. And in this case, it's multivariate normal. Um, almost without exception, it's multivariate normal. It's only recently that people have played around with allowing different kinds of distributions for theta. And um, in terms of software, you'd have to pretty much write your own software if you wanted to play around with that. So first step is we start with some kind of starting value for the item parameters. And the easiest way to get that is to convert the classical test theory Haskell test theory versions. So we could uh, get the item total correlation and convert that into an A. We could get the uh, proportion passing and convert that into a B in logits. We would want to compute the likelihood for each person, the height, given by those current param parameter values. So the model itself gives us the probability of the response given the item parameters and theta. And then we take the likelihood across all participants, all responses from a person, and it goes into this little formula right here. So in contrast to the multivariate normal formula that gave us height, this one's a lot easier. Across the items from a person, it's the probability that they got it right if they did get it right, times the probability that they got it wrong if they did get it wrong. And so we multiply all of those things together and we get a likelihood or we take the log and we add it together and we get a log likelihood. In order to get these probabilities though, we have to know what theta is for each person. And this is the tricky part. We don't know what theta is for each person and we're not gonna know because theta is not a model parameter for each person. So what we're going to end up having to do is to integrate theta out of the likelihood. The idea is that we try on what the probability would be across a different range of theta values and we try out the same theta values for all persons and we add that all of those tries into the likelihood. I've got a slide for this but it's the, the generic term for this is integration in this case is done by Gaussian quadrature. We're going to take the continuous distribution for theta and we're going to carve it up into rectangles. And yes, those of you who had me for the generalized modeling course or for the clustered multi-level modeling course, we did talk about this in those courses, so this may sound familiar. And you may see some of the same slides. Um, if you have the right answers, then the sum total of all of these heights is as tall as it's going to be, and they can try out different versions of the estimated parameters until you get to some sort of height that doesn't change much, and the thing finishes. And there are different ways of going about this process of figuring out new parameter values. But the idea that you have to do this integration, this is why full information maximum likelihood, it takes a long time and can fall apart in these models. Because what we're trying to do is find the height of two different kinds of distributions. We have the normal distribution of the thetas, and we have the Bernoulli distribution of the items. And so when you have those two things together, 
there's not a ready-made closed form that summarizes both of them. I did have students in a previous class try to name it though. They came up with um, either normuli or bernormal. That's what it would be called if you have a normal theta and a uh, bino ber 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 normal. Bernoulli item response, bernormal or normuli. Point being though, there's not a formula that goes with that name. So we have to go through this uh, much more intensive process of trying out thetas. So the idea of this Gaussian quadrature, this idea of the number of rectangles that you're using to approximate the distribution of theta, that is referred to as the number of quadrature points. This is something that your software will decide for you or that you can tell it as an option. M plus, for instance, does 15 quadrature points. Um, some of the older IRT software like Bilog and Parscale and those, I think they do 30 for each dimension. Um, in SAS, if you run these sorts of models, you can specify it in NL mixed, or if you have Glimix, it will choose the number of quadrature points it thinks it needs. Um, Stata's generalized models uh, with these options default to seven. So this is another thing that you would have to check your documentation to see what it does for you. So this is how it's going to work. Here's an example. Let's say that I'm trying to integrate theta across just two items for each person. So two items would not make the model identified, but it works better for the math. So let's say that I have um, an item mean that for the first item that's 0.73 and 0.27 for the second item. That corresponds to a difficulty, a logit of positive one or negative one. So item difficulty would be the opposite of that since intercepts and, and uh, difficulties are going in opposite directions. So we have start values of our Bs for these items. Let's say that A is one for both of them just to make the math easy. So that's my current guess as to what the item parameters are. Now I need to get a height. In order to get a height, I've got to have a guess as to what theta is too. So let's say that we try out three different versions of theta. I'm going to say that theta has a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a variance of one. So I'm going to try out a relatively low theta of minus two, an average theta of zero, and a high theta of two. And here's my model. So I'm going to predict the logit of the response directly with my 2PL, where A is going to be one, and B for each item is my best guess to start with using these two values up here. So the first time, if I'm trying on for this person a theta of minus two, here's my formula. So the one is uh, not shown here. So it's minus two minus a minus one. That works out to a predicted logit of minus one, which translates into a predicted probability of a one of 0.27 or a predicted probability of a zero of 0.73. Well, I know what the right answer is. I know for this person whether or not they got item one correct. And let's say that they ended up getting both of these items correct. So the likelihood of these two numbers multiplied together, so the 0.27 for this item and the 0.05 for this item, because they got both of them right, is that number right here. Now, in thinking about how likely these theta values would be, in a normal distribution, how likely do you think a theta of minus two would be? Not very likely, right? There's not a lot of people that far out. So we're gonna downweight that guess because that theta value is not likely to happen. So we're gonna multiply the likelihood under that guess by a lower probability. You can think of this as a weight. And so here's the result of my guess if I have a theta of minus two. Now let's do this again with a theta of zero. If somebody has a theta of zero, the predicted logit for the first item is one and the predicted logit for the second item is minus one. That corresponds to these probabilities. We're gonna multiply them together and now I've got a likelihood of these two items being right. Now how likely is a theta of zero? This is about as likely as you can get, right? It's smack in the middle. So we're gonna upweight that guess. So we're going to multiply the probability of, of observing a theta that big times the, prob the likelihood of these two items both being correct, if that's their theta, and then I get this result out here. 
And then I'm going to try on a theta of plus 2. And here's the likelihood of both items if they have a theta of plus 2. But plus 2 is not very likely. So I'm going to downweight that and multiply this out, and I get this number over here. So this is saying I have three quadrature points. I have three tries for what theta would be. I figure out what the likelihood of the data is under all three tries. So it's the likelihood of what actually happened. So if they got both items right, it would be taken from this column of y equals 1. If they got both items wrong, it would be taken from this column or intermixed of the two if they got one right and one wrong. And now we have all of these guesses that we have to add together and we get one sum total. What is the height of this person's data combined after trying on these thetas and weighting each one by how likely that it is to be? And so then we have this one number that summarizes the height for that person's data. And we got to do that for all the people. So this How did is... you get the last column? Because when I was following what you were saying, I thought you said to multiply the theta probability times the likelihood column, the likelihood of both. And times um, two also. Oh, okay. That's why I was like, that number doesn't add up to what, or multiply what I got. Thank you. Yeah, so it's the, the theta probability has to, these two things have to go to one. So like if I just had this by itself, it would be 0.5, and it's the width of each one. So it's like if you have 0.5 in the middle, it's like there should be two of them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. But the idea is that we're trying to come up with the likelihood of each person's data over a span of what theta could be. And we try on a different number of thetas, that's quadrature points. And this is just one dimension. What if I had two factors in the model? Well, then I would need low, medium, high for each one. That's nine tries. Now, what if I did what M plus did, which is 15 per dimension? Now, that's 225 tries. And what if I had three factors? That's 725 tries. So this is why multidimensional IRT models are a thing, right? There's this distinction as to what happens when you get multiple dimensions. Estimation gets a lot harder because each dimension then requires integration and you have to integrate over all of them simultaneously if they're correlated. There's some shortcuts to this if the factors are uncorrelated that you can take that make it go faster. But otherwise, this process takes a lot longer and may result in the model not converging if you don't have enough people. So in small samples, this is particularly uh, not going to work as great. But this is a marginal maximum likelihood where we're using all of the original data to try and find the most likely item parameters. And in doing so, we're marginalizing across what theta could be for each person. Different tries for what theta could be all get represented in the likelihood. What counts as a small sample in this case? Great question. It depends on how many items that you have. So the more items that you have, the more A's and B's you need to find, the more people you need to find them. Um, I had, for my dissertation, I had 38 items, and I asked Susan Embertson, who was on my dissertation committee, if I could have a model that had separate slopes across items. And she's like, how many people did you have? And I said, 155. How many items do you have? 38. She laughed at me. She actually laughed at me. She's one of the most stoic, like serious people I've ever met in my life. And she opened her mouth and laughed at me. I can't have 38 slopes with 155 people, apparently. And that's only one dimension. I said, how many people would I need to do that? She's like, oh, at least seven or 800. So you never know until you try how many people is too few. But this process is a lot more computationally intensive than what a CFA model is because a CFA model reduces down to a multivariate normal likelihood. It's a closed form that you can plug in guesses really easy. This process of having to try on thetas 
especially for multiple dimensions, is what slows it down. Um, let's see, question. I've seen studies where they fit a separate IRT model for each factor. Would a multidimensional IRT be better in that case? To the extent that the factors are related, yes. Because if the factors are related, they can borrow information from each other and trying to figure out what the other sets of item parameters would be. If they're not related, then I don't think you would have a savings. It, would, it wouldn't, shouldn't make a difference whether you try to estimate everything simultaneously. So this process will make it take longer. So just to warn you, when you're running your own data for homework five, those of you who are fitting more than one factor may have to wait for a while. If you run into estimation problems, let me know and I can help you troubleshoot. One of the things that I would probably suggest that you do is reduce the number of quadrature points. Because the fewer tries, the faster it goes. This is at every single step of the iterations it has to do all of these tries. Um, there's also approaches to where you're trying to sample from the, the tries rather than rep represent them all. There's an MCMC integration option in M+, and that's also the logic behind um, MCMC estimation, is to try and sample from all of these things rather than try them all on. So there's things we can do to try and make it work. If you run into estimation problems, I can help. Um, okay, I think I'm caught up on the questions. I have one more question. Yes, okay. please. Um, so I, I'm, I think I'm right in that um, one of the nice things about IRT is that once you have that information about the item, you don't have to have all the items. You can like take different items and look at someone's score based on that, right? You can predict their theta, yes, okay. based on, yes. yes. And so once so you have, I, yeah, go ahead. Well, what seems confusing to me about this is um, the theta it, oh, so like you're using the item diff, it, I, I guess like for some reason it seems circular to me. Like if you are using like the people that you gave the test to inform what the difficulty of the item is, and then you're using the difficulty of the item to predict someone's theta. So doesn't that mean it's still like population or sample dependent, I mean? The, the values themselves are not supposed to be, but the standard errors will be. Standard errors, okay. Yeah, um, the chapters, I think it's chapter seven and eight from Susan, the Emerton and Reese text is talking about estimation of the model as well as, as she calls it scoring of theta, because you're right, once you have the item parameters, it's you just plug in um, this process that's on this slide 74, you can use it to find what the most likely theta is given the item parameters. But yeah, there is sort of a, it's a back and forthness to it. Um, the idea of trying out all possible thetas for each person is trying to, I think, avoid the circularity, right? Because you're not, you're not saying, oh, this person has this theta and now I'm going to go find the item parameters. You're acknowledging the uncertainty and what theta could be for each person and weighting the guesses by how likely each type of theta is. Okay. So, yeah, this is one of those things... Um, the, the factor scores that you get out of M plus are the same, whether you're doing CFA or IRT. Um, if you used factor scores in the context of CFA, somebody will probably yell at you about that because they'll be like, why didn't you do the SEM? Because the SEM allows you to look at the relationships among the factor scores without treating them as observed variables. But IRT, the point in a lot of applications is to get estimates of the thetas and then go do something to them. Um, the thing about that, though, is that not only is the theta the best guess for a person, but it has a standard error to it. And so unless you bring those standard errors with it, you, the thetas have differential reliability that you wouldn't acknowledge. So each person has a distribution. Here's my little normal distribution for what theta should be. And if you're at an area of the curve where there's not a lot of information, your distribution of theta could be like this. And if you're at the area of the curve where you have a lot of information, it could be really tiny. And without that additional reliability info, I think it's misleading just to have a theta. Especially when you don't have very many items. And that's why in the context of educational testing, you have hundreds and hundreds of items because you're trying to get the standard error to be infinitesimally small to where you can just give the theta and call it good. If you have seven items like this, 
standard error is going to be huge and differentially huge at different points where the information is. So, okay, other questions? So this is full information maximum likelihood that we're talking about. Um, I'm going to skip this stuff. This is talking about how they find a theta. This is in chapter 8 of Susan's book. That's where I actually took this, this thing. But it's the same process of trying on different values of thetas and coming up with the likelihood because you know what the item parameters are and so you know you're trying to find the value of theta that makes the data the highest and so it uses calculus to try and trace the, the likelihood function for each person and figure out where the guesses should go as to theta. Uh, the second derivative of the likelihood function tells you the steepness of the curve. It helps you navigate your guess as to whether it should jump up high or jump up a lot. And the direction of the derivative tells you whether you're too high or too low. Um, all of that stuff is sort of inconsequential for our purposes in terms of evaluating whether or not the model fits and why that is such a pain in the ass. So there are three kinds of thetas that you can get. Um, the one that comes out of factor scores under uh, full information maximum likelihood is what's known as EAP, expected a posteriori scoring. That's the mean of the theta distribution for each person. Um, the other limited information version is, is the mode instead. And so to the extent that the distribution for each person is skewed, they will not converge onto the same answer. So EAP is the one that you want if you're going to have thetas for any one person, and that's what full information ML gives you. So in these models, we talked about this last time in the context of testing the Roche model, you can compare relative differences in fit using minus two log likelihood, the same as in a lot of other stats models. So you can test, for instance, whether you need different loadings or one loading. You can test whether adding a second factor makes the model fit better. You can do all the same sorts of things you did in CFA. But none of this tells us whether or not the model fits at all. We don't know anything about that yet. And it turns out trying to figure that out in full information maximum likelihood is very difficult to do. So there are ways of assessing fit in IRT models that are sort of older methods. They're referred to as item fit or person fit. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, M plus doesn't give you those. Most of those methods rely on outputting some sort of estimate of theta for persons and then looking at predictions. That process of outputting theta introduces error to the process. And so it makes the fit statistics suspect, I think, for those reasons. Um, the way that people assess fit in M plus with respect to the model is looking at two things. Um, to what extent are the marginal probabilities of each category reproduced? That's what's known as univariate item fit. So if we know in the data, for instance, that 70% of the people got a one and 30% of the people got a zero, we should, the model should predict those marginal probabilities. And that's usually not a problem. Uh, bivariate model fit is looking at chi-squares for each pair of items and trying to see to what extent the four cells of the items in binary data would be reproduced. So there would be a whole lot of those, one for every possible pair of items. And that output is known as TEC10. That's how you get the bivariate item fits in, in M+. Um, it generates a whole, whole lot of output. And that can give you sort of the discrepancy between the model and the data with, with respect to each pair. It's the analog of normalized residuals, but it's a series of chi-square tables rather than summarized in a matrix. There's a chapter um, that I gave you on your reading list, the 2015 chapter by Albert. He introduces some other measures of item fit. Um, these are not in M+, as far as I know. They're probably in R and other things. So these are other measures of fit that you may see introduced. But why is this so difficult? Is because we don't have an H1 model. The correct model with respect to what the estimation process is trying to reproduce is the multi-way contingency table of all possible item responses. That's what the data are trying to reproduce. And the way that we know how many possible cells there are in that table is the number of responses with the number of items as an exponent. So for instance, 
if I have 24 items, such as there was in your gambling example in homework four, that's two to the 24. So there are 16,000, excuse me, 16 million 777,216 possible response patterns to 24 binary items. So that series of patterns is what the model is trying to predict. Do you remember what you learned about chi-square and small samples back in the day? At what point do chi-square results start to break down if you have small samples? What's the expected minimum for each cell? We have a vote for five, I think. Five is what I was taught. Five to ten I've seen in different sources. So yeah, in order for a chi-square statistic, that matches the observed contingency table to the one that's expected by a model. For that comparison to be valid, you need at least five to 10 people in each cell. So for this 16 million response patterns times a minimum of five people in each one, yeah, T is laughing, exactly. What's 16 million times five? More people than have ever done research in the entire world. Right, So we don't have a basis for judging how well the model predicts the contingency table relative to the data. We don't have enough people to fill out the cells. So degrees of freedom in these models is the number of possible response patterns minus the number of estimated parameters minus one. So the degrees of freedom would be this. And so this is the reason on your output M plus is referring to the number of cells in a contingency table and how many had to be deleted because they were empty. And the Pearson chi-square and the likelihood, I forget what it's called, there's two different kinds of chi-squares on there. Those are basically garbage because they're referring to this observed versus expected idea where we're never going to have enough people to fill it out. So there is no saturated model in this approach. There's, we don't have enough people to estimate it. So there is no saturated model. Guess what comes from the saturated model? What are the fit statistics that you looked at in your homework to decide whether or not you had good fit? That all came from the saturated model. A chi-square test, right? That's, that's gone. RMSEA? That's gone. SRMR? That's gone. And these don't have a null model either. So we don't have CFI or TLI. So all the things that we would rely on to summarize fit are not available to us with this method of estimation. So um, that's the bad news. So if you're saying to yourself, well, then why would I do this? And why is it that people are able to use CFA for categorical data? Because there's another way of estimating these models that is way easier. And if you're willing to live with some of the assumptions, then it makes it a lot easier to assess fit and a lot faster to do estimation. And that is to, rather than trying to capture all possible response patterns of the original item responses, you start with a summary of the item responses and the moder model factor analyzes that summary. So welcome to limited information estimation. So the approach that I'm gonna describe to you is weightedly squares. Uh, there are lots of versions of this. If you are using a package that is not M plus, it is known as diagonally weighted, lead <laughs> diagonally weighted least squares. It is WLSMV within M plus, which stands for, I had to write it out, weighted least squares parameter estimates that use a diagonal weight matrix and a mean and variance adjusted chi-square test. That's a mouthful. Uh, the idea is that what we're going to do is first estimate a summary of the item responses. So remember what we had in CFA? what the right answer key was, right? The H1 model in CFA was a covariance matrix. 
you let the items be whatever they want. So the covariance matrix has uh, all the mean vectors, it has all the variances and all the covariance matrix, and that's your H1 model. Well, for binary data, Pearson correlation is not a good version of that, right? Because it's, it is going to be limited by um, uh, skewness in the data. So anytime you have a binary variable that's split 50-50, anytime that it's away from 50-50, the Pearson correlation is going to be limited. So we need another kind of correlation. So I'll introduce that on just um, a moment. But conceptually, you can think of it as, well, what if we had a correlation among the logits or probits as our, as our summary? And then we could fit a factor analysis to that summary in the same way that you can fit a CFA model if you only input a covariance matrix. You can figure out all the parameters from it. So that's the basis of this approach, is that you're going to start with a summary. The model is going to begin by estimating a summary of the item responses, and that's now your observed data. And it's going to estimate a model to try and predict that matrix. And now we've got an H1 model again. We've got something that we can compare predicted versus observed in a very easy, straightforward form. So the, the type of matrix that we're going to have here is what's known as a tetrachoric correlation matrix. That's a mouthful. Have you guys heard of tetrachoric correlations before? No, says Terry. Most people I can see are shaking their heads. Well, the idea is this. So let's say that I've got a pair of binary items. So I know, based on the data, the proportion of people who fall into these four possible cells, right? People who both got a zero on people who got a zero on both items, excuse me, people who got a one on both items, and people who got one right and one wrong in either direction, right? And I know that these four probabilities sum to one. I've got that data, right? Right? You with me? Remember chi-squares from like a million years ago when you just had very simple and you had like a chi-square test of association in these things and it worked out to be the same thing? So we know these areas, right? Now what if I was like, no, 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 no. We don't have binary data. What we have is a continuous variable that's latent. It's unobserved. So if I were to believe that the unobserved variable for each of these things has a multivariate normal distribution together, then I can map these areas onto a bivariate normal distribution. So if two variables are unrelated, you would see like a sphere, like a giant circle. And as two variables are related, so the height is the z-axis, the vertical axis, it looks like a taco. And that multivariate normal distribution tells us then the expected area within each of these quadrants where the quadrants come from the proportion of people in each. So I'm going to try and estimate as the tetrachoric correlation the correlation that would be consistent with observing these proportions of people in each of these four quadrants. So if I had two variables that were unrelated, then I have a sphere, and it would be 25, 25, 25, 25. If I had two variables that were perfectly related to each other, so a taco that goes this way, I think, backwards for you guys. Is this a positive correlation? Did I get it right? Hooray. It's 3 o'clock, and I've still got a positive correlation in my, my toolbox here. So if you picture like a taco, right, because it's, it's a three-dimensional hand that I'm doing here. Well, if these things are perfectly related, then you would have everybody either getting both wrong or both right, and you'd have nobody on the outside. So the number of people that are on the off cells give you an index of how far from perfect the correlation is. And so it's trying to find a correlation that would be consistent with the proportions of people in each of these quadrants. So it's an estimated correlation 
that is based on these cells and the estimate gets um, more and more harder to pin down when you're in the situation where one of them is empty. So you will see an error message about that in M plus that you encountered an empty cell, in which case it's not sure what the correlation should be. So the idea is that it's trying to estimate what the correlation would have been had these variables been continuous. That's the idea. So it's a correlation that's not a Pearson correlation. It's called tetrachoric if it's binary variables, and the same principle is going to hold for ordinal variables, but that one is called polychoric. You can get these correlations um, from PROCFREAK in SAS. Um, trying to remember what they are in STATA. I'd, I'd have to ask the Google about that one, but all software packages are capable of providing these correlations for you. You just have to dig a little bit to get them. But that's my new H1 model. Rather than a regular flavor covariance matrix that we had in CFA, it's this estimated version. The correlation among the, the underlying continuous responses that gave rise to the binary items. So there's a little bit of like disconnect with reality there, but it but you can work out what the math should be. So the weighted part then. So each of these correlations for every possible pair of items is a guess. It's like, eh, it's consistent with the correlation of looks like I'm gonna go with 0.6, right, based on the area. And the more people you have, the better the guess is gonna be. And the, the more area, um, I would say the more symmetric it is, the easier it is to guess. The model is going to try to reproduce the tetrachoric correlations that are estimated more precisely than those that are not. They get a priority in terms of being reproduced. And so that weighting process is referring to, uh, that's what the weighted least squares refers to. Um, we have a full weight matrix where we have every single possible correlation has a variance and it has a covariance, so like a sampling matrix, and only focusing on how precise each of the correlations is, is the diagonally weighted least squares. We're not focusing on how precise the, the correlation between the standard errors of the correlations is. It, that's a mouthful, but point being, we're focusing more on the correlations that are well estimated than those that aren't. We're not using all of the possible information, we're just truncating it to the diagonal. So diagonally weighted least squares is the idea. And the mean and variance WLSMV on the name corrects for this process. Okay. So that's a lot of technical shit. Can I back up a minute and talk and talk some English? Would that be okay? Yeah. So so here's the thing that is confusing in the way people talk about this, and I don't want you to make the same mistakes. You will see people say things like, um, I use WLSMV because I didn't want to assume normality of my items. They'll talk about doing CFA for categorical data, and they'll say, I use WLSMV instead of maximum likelihood. That's not what they mean. The difference between what WLSMV is focusing on, it is a different model. So this is not necessary if you're fitting a regular CFA model. In CFA models, limited versus full information maximum likelihood is not really a thing. If you had complete data, they would they would lead to the exact same set of estimates. In these models, the need for WLSMV arises because we're fitting these logistic or probit regression models. So when people say that they're using WLSMV instead of maximum likelihood, they are talking about simultaneously a change in how the models are being estimated and a change in what the model actually is. So this full information versus limited information is only a distinction once you have a logistic or a probit regression model underlying your factor analysis. It's not a thing that's necessary in CFA. And historically, 
when people talk about these things, when people say IRT, they mean A's and B's as a way of talking about the model combined with full information maximum likelihood. That combination is what IRT refers to when people talk about it that way. When people say I did CFA for categorical data and they report loadings and intercepts or loadings and thresholds, they are most often talking about a limited information estimation paired with a factor analysis way of talking about the model. So representation and estimation are confounded in the way that people talk about these things. But you can have all four possibilities. You can talk about A's and B's that you got out of weighted least squares. You can talk about A's and B's that you got out of maximum likelihood. You can talk about loadings and thresholds that you got out of maximum likelihood, and you can talk about loadings and thresholds that you got out of weighted least squares. So why would you do one versus the other? If you're doing weighted least squares, you don't have numeric integration. You can have as many thetas as you want. It's not going to make it take any more time. So in the same way that adding multiple factors in a confirmatory factor analysis didn't change the complexity of the estimation, it doesn't change the complexity here. So weighted least squares is a way that you can get multiple factor models for categorical data to estimate quickly. Because we have this covariance matrix that we're coming back to of tetrachoric correlations, we've got an answer key. That's our H1 model. So now we've got RMSEA, we've got a chi-square, we've got an SRMR. We've got a, we can do a null model version of this and so we can pick up CFI and TLI. So all the, the fit indices that you learned about in CFA are back if you pick this method of estimation. And I sound like a game show host right now, like, but that's not all. You can have multiple thetas, you can have easy ways of assessing fit, and you're like, for the low, low price of assumptions about missing data. Dun, dun, dun. So here's the thing. I'll do my, my Joe Biden invitation. Look, here's the deal. This is not a bunch of malarkey. Thank you very much. I'm here all week. Here's the deal. Anytime that your analysis starts with a summary of information, you have to assume that any missing data is missing completely at random. So if I start with a correlation matrix, it doesn't know which items went into it. There's no way that I can adjust anything for the idea that missing responses might not be missing at random. So any missing data has to be missing completely at random if you're going to start with the summary matrix and then analyze that summary. If you're willing to do the maximum likelihood full information quadrature craziness, then that's missing at random instead. So when would this matter? Well, do you think people skip items for reasons? Probably. Yeah, most likely. Now, it may be the case that there's different versions of a survey. If you have like a planned missingness design, for instance, where you deliberately skip some questions for some people and they never even saw the questions and they have missing data, okay, I'll believe that's completely at random. But most of the time, there's a reason why people don't answer questions. And the difference between completely at random and at random, completely at random is exactly what it sounds like. At random is conditionally random. So after we factor in all the other things that they did tell us about, after we factor in all of their predictor values and all of the other responses that we have observed, then it's random. So like if I'm doing my test of psychotic behavior, right? and someone answered all of the questions and they skipped the last one, it's like, well, it's random amongst the psychotic people. 
right? Because I've already decided that you're a psycho based on your other answers. So it's random amongst that subset or random uh, amongst the typical people instead. So if you're in a situation where people are skipping items for reasons, then this is inconsistent. If you're doing a longitudinal study where you're measuring these items over time and some people don't come back for reasons, that's inconsistent with this. So this is one of the few situations in which if you're faced with non-random missing data and you want to use this method of estimation because you've got a lot of factors or you want an easy way of fit, assessing fit, then you may actually need to do multiple imputation to address your missing data. I can't believe I actually had to say that, but it's true in this one case. So uh, I know M plus has a lot of imputation routines. A lot of other software does. Multiple imputation is a strategy for addressing missing data in which you can impute predicted responses as well as the error around them. And you would end up with multiple complete versions of the data that you would have to analyze the model on all of the versions and aggregate the results. So it's a more labor intensive process, automated to a great extent by software, but not completely. So the, the catch, the catch to this wonderful, this makes it faster and easier is missing data. That's the catch. So when you're describing the kind of factor analysis that you did, this is why I'm asking for the certain elements in your report. What is the model? Because if you said I did a factor analysis, I have no idea of knowing if you have loadings and thresholds, if you're predicting the original response, if you're predicting the logit response or the probit response, describing what the model is and then how you estimated it as a separate piece of information. That should help your readers follow what you're doing. Oh, and by the way, um, the other cost of doing business under WLSMV is that it's all probit. You don't get a choice. So that, that makes it harder to, to uh, do predicted probabilities and that kind of stuff. It's all probits. There are two versions of scalings of WLSMV. And it has to do with whether or not the total variance of each of the variables in this tetracorrelation cor matrix is set to 1, or just the residual variance is set to 1. In your examples and in your homework, I'm asking you to use the theta parameterization option, as it is known. So that will be a choice, parameterization equals theta, because that one simplifies to the probit model, where we're saying that the error variance is 1. So that version of the scaling directly corresponds to the IRT parameters. The delta method takes the total variance and makes it one, which is a little bit trickier in terms of the, the conversions back and forth across the A's, B's, loadings, and thresholds. All right, nested model comparisons are done differently too. So in WLSMV, there's no more likelihood. Like you literally will not get an HO likelihood or an H1 likelihood because it's not done in likelihood. Instead, you have to ask M plus to do your nested model comparisons. And it's a process that's known as diff test. And the way that it works is that when you estimate a model that has more parameters as the first one, you save the results from that model using the save data command. And then for your comparison model that is nested within it that has fewer parameters, you will add a line on the analysis command that uses the information from the previous model and does the comparison. And then the chi-square test for the comparison is part of your output in the simpler model. So you will get a chance to practice that in your homework as well. All right, so under ML, there's no fit that's directly provided. The best that you can do is look through the pairs uh, pairs of item chi-squares. That's given by the TEC10 output. Under WLSMV, you will get an option under residual that gives you the leftover correlations analogous to the normalized residuals, but there's not a normalized version. It will just give you the straight discrepancy between the tetrachoric correlations estimated from the data and the ones that are predicted by the model. So local fit will work exactly the same way and global fit will work exactly the same way as well. 
Okay. Questions as we're wrapping up here. So given that in regular flavor maximum likelihood you can't have error covariances, you actually can in WLSMB. So that's another thing I could put on the pro list of this report. But if you are in, in regular flavor maximum likelihood and you can't have error covariances, here's what you can do instead. So those of you who ended up with error covariances in your model in homework three, this is for you. This is what you'll have to do instead in homework five. Instead of using with, where you list the residual variances with each item with the width that creates this covariance here, we have to create a separate factor. So for instance, if I have five items that all load on one trait and I want to create an extra relationship between items two and three, I have all the items load on one trait and then I define a separate factor. I'm calling it a specific factor or a method factor I'm calling it error factor because it's taking the place of the error covariance. I'm fixing each of the loadings for this pair of items to one and estimating its variance. And I'm holding the correlation, the covariance, excuse me, of that new factor with the original factor at zero. And the variance of the new factor becomes the error covariance. So the idea is that you're representing all of the ways the items are related to each other through factors only. And this is the same thing as just adding an error covariance, adding a new factor with both items loading on it perfectly and estimating the factor's variance. If you had a negative error covariance you were trying to put in, one of these would have to go to a negative one to make that work. And so then after doing that, you would end up with the variance of the error factor as your error covariance. Ta-da. How do you present this to a reviewer? Oh, better yet, you make this a selling point. This is not a convoluted mess. This is a bifactor model. It's fancy and awesome. That's how you sell it. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah, it's a selling point. So if you have a whole bunch of error covariances, you put them into a factor. And then you could call that factor like the positive wording factor, or the negative wording factor, or the these items all asked about this in common factor. Yeah. All right, that's enough for today, don't you think? More than. All right, let me know if you need anything. Otherwise, I'll be happy to see you on Thursday. Take it easy, folks.